Yeah. 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 I don't know whether, do you want to find us? Yeah. 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 Right, we're going to start off, I think. Right, thank you very much, everyone, for coming for this um, talk with Graham Arnold. Um, as you know, Graham was one of the founder members of the Brotherhood of Royalists. And 40 years ago, in 1976, they held their first exhibition at the Royal Academy. Um, and um, Graham and Annie have been exhibiting ever since together, on and off, for those 40 years. So it's quite a, an important exhibition. Yes, and, very, um, very important. Yeah. And, and I hope you all have a good look at Graham's work in the back room, which is like a little museum. And some lovely, very touching work there as well. So, Graham, thank you very much for coming, and um, he's going to give a personal view of the Brotherhood of Royalists. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, as you know, the Royalists suddenly burst upon the scene in uh, 1976 at the Royal Academy, taking over a room there, and each one of them has done a painting specially for it. And we also had a little notice saying why we were called the Ruralists and how it was that um, we had all come together and what we, were, what we were against as much as what we were for. We were rebelling against um, the, the amount of abstract art that the, the galleries in London were, were showing and their reluctance to show the kind of paintings that we, we loved. That was one of the reasons. But it was a long time before that. It took a long time for the ruralists to actually form. And all I can do now is just to tell you my own personal story of how I contributed my little bit to the, to the ruralists. So I'm going to start at the beginning when I was born, which was 1932, in Sydenham, Beckenham and Penge, where they all come together. Our house was there, so sometimes we said we lived in Beckenham, sometimes we said we lived in Sydenham, but never said that we lived in Penge. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we lived there, oh, my mother and father, my grandmother, and I had two elder sisters. I also had a brother, but my brother was sort of much older and he didn't seem to have fit into the family. I never saw him. Uh, so there was just my two elder sisters and my parents. That was in 1932. Then in 1936, they had another baby, a, a little girl. So now I had a younger sister and two older sisters. My first memory was 1936 when I was taken up out of my bed by my father, taken outside into the garden in the dark, and the whole of the uh, night sky was filled with fire. And little pieces of stuff were coming down like snow, but they were all red and glowing. And what was happening was the Crystal Palace was a fire, on fire, up on the hill. We were only a mile, mile from it, on the hill where they built the Crystal Palace. And um, that was my very first memory. My memories then um, start to pick up in around 1938, when again my father, who was a publisher, and an amateur artist, he loved art, he loved painting, he loved looking at art. He began to take an interest in me, because I was also used to dab about with paint by his side. He used to paint in the kitchen at weekends. And I used to join him. And gradually but surely, he sort of guided me. Even at that very, very early age, he was taking me to galleries when I was seven. And um, the war, then the war broke out in 1939, and we were directly in line with what we thought was going to be the bombing, like they did to Warsaw, the Blitzkrieg. He thought the whole place would go up, and so 
he got the dining room table, which was very, very thick oak, and pushed it up into the corner and put an old carpet over it, which fell down by the sides. And my younger sister, who is now five years old, and me, I was eight years old, used to sleep under this table, put a little mattress down, and uh, we were very happy there. In fact, my little sister could stand up and not, <laughs> head did not touch the table top. And I could actually spin round, because there was a bar across. <laughs> so we were very, very nicely happy there, and loved it. And the nights went by, and nothing happened, and we still continued to sleep there. Once or twice there was a siren, and then all the rest of the family would come down and go under the stairs. There's my two elder sister and my mother. My father was an ARP warden, and he'd go out. But nothing, no bombs dropped or anything until about... I think it was about May or June, the, we could hear bangs and bombs and things in the distance. But all changed on the night of September the 7th, I think it was, when we, we found out later that the greatest number of bombers ever flying at once was being assembled over France. Uh, it was about between 700 and 850 bombers and they were coming in and they picked them up and they were coming in a southeasterly direction which meant that they were coming right over us and so the sirens went at about 8 o'clock and at about 9 o'clock we heard the, the bombers coming getting nearer and nearer we heard the ack ack which was all in the parks around terrific din going on and the din it grew in intensity until there were, we could actually hear bombs falling uh, getting nearer and nearer and then absolute pandemonium of tremendous explosions that hurt your ears all the glass in our windows came in and still more explosions until one enormous one and the whole of the top of the house, our house the roof and the upper bedrooms collapsed and fell down onto our table in our room. We were, the, the table was completely up to there in Debre and it was covered with tiles and bits and pieces from the upstairs bedroom. And we were dug out eventually and my mother and father, uh, my father came and he helped to dig out another ARP people. We dug out all the. Another thing that had happened was that the, the blast had blown the soot down the chimney out into the room, <laughs> plus all the plaster dust. So we emerged absolutely <laughs> covered in filth and so on in our nighties. But we were all right. No person did get a scratch. And I went out in the morning because it was now dawn. We went outside, and the house opposite, there was no house there. The house that side, no house. House that side, absolutely no house. Just blasted away. And our road has got a lot of trees down it. And these trees are all completely covered in sheets, um, carpets, bits and pieces of furniture dangling from the, from the things. And an amazing sight. The road itself was about three feet deep in Debray. Anyway, that was the end of the memory. I have no more memories until my sister Penny and I holding hands and with our gas masks, just like you see them, you know, evacuees, were on the station of Hay. How it happened, how we got there, I don't know, but it was the day following this calamity at home. So we were whisked away with a lot of other children, about 50, and we all ended up on Hay Station, and we were taken by various people to their homes. And Penny and I were taken by the headmaster of the local school and his wife. It turned out to be horrible and cruel. We didn't like them at all. They didn't like us. 
they probably thought our manners were appalling because at meal times they'd suddenly say don't do that and they'd make us stand in the corner facing the corner for an hour and I didn't like it and Penny um, used to I could hear her crying at night uh, because it was we couldn't understand what had happened at all uh, there's no didn't see her mama or her father and how we got there I don't know but I lay awake at night thinking how on earth was I going to get a cell of this and in the end I decided to write to my mother so I wrote to my mother at our address that had been bombed and the amazing thing was they still delivered the letters and they still delivered the milk to the houses that were still standing you know as if nothing had happened so she got the letter and the letter said unless you unless you write unless you come within the next week I am going to walk home with Penny I had not clue how to walk home still <laughs> and within three or four days my mother appeared and she appeared with my other two sisters and she said don't worry we're, I'm going to rent a little cottage and we're all going to be together and that's when my life was transformed because I lived only on pavements and concrete played out in the road and suddenly I was dumped down in hay with the all the fields and the grass and all the trees endlessly and then the huge mountains behind and the river Y and so it was absolute paradise and we played there for oh, I don't know, two, three years I think, two or three years my father used to come down at weekends he used to go out for picnics and things and it was absolutely beautiful. In the, in the summer the River Wye was just very very low and grew a lot of weeds and we could paddle in it and then in the winter it was a raging infern, tur tur water pouring down, huge trees coming down so it was marvellous, absolutely dramatic. And then father said you're coming back to London now because I've rented a house and we can all be together again. But unfortunately it was, a, it, was a, it was a sad time. But from then on, by now, I was nine-ish, ten, my father took more and more interest in me and he started me painting in oil painting and um, he, he, he put up little still lives and showed me how to draw it and then he'd paint it and he'd take me to all these galleries and. He was a publisher and they had illustrators for their Bibles because he was a religious publisher. They published mostly Bibles and these Bibles were illustrated. He said, I'm going to take you to a real artist. He took me in the car and to collect a painting from this artist who was doing four paintings for them a year. And so the first time I saw what the studios looked like with all the canvases and unfinished paintings and brushes and everything. I thought it was absolutely amazing, amazing place. And um, so this was about nine, the end of the war, 1946. And then he um, decided that I would best go to a school which had a very, very strong art link. Now in, in Beckenham there happened to be a technical school next to the Beckingham Baths, which were famous, they had an Olympic sized swimming pool, and two others, and a cafe, and then next, right next to that there was a most marvellous library, it had been built in the 30s, reference uh, rooms, records, you could borrow those, and a huge number of books, and then right next to that was the Beckingham Art School, and if you went to the technical school, on a Saturday morning you could go to the art school and you could be taught by the tutors at the art school. So and this is where I came up against one of the most remarkable teachers that I'd had. 
I was only about 14 or 15 at the time. And I went over to the art school on a Saturday morning and he used to teach perspective and um, object drawing and composition. And he's, he, he was a German, tall man, very, very powerful personality and smelt of garlic. Which I, that was the first time I had smelled garlic. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, spoke it with a heavy German accent, which sort of gave it a great authority. And he was very dynamic. And he'd start teaching perspective. Our first lesson was eye level and all that. And he'd have a bit of chalk, and it was always a wonky, wonky line like that. And it, could, it ended at the blackboard. He just carried on. <laughs> across the wall <laughs> until the whole of the end of the wall was covered in all these lines going everywhere and as we proceeded so it got more and more complex we started with boxes here and boxes there looking up so you've got all these lines going up but by the time we finished we were doing the perspective of a spiral staircase with a plank leaning against it with, this, with the sun shining on the plank so that we had to get the perspective of the shadows as they fell on this spiral staircase. Really, really complicated. And his objects, his object drawing, was a um, size table, trestle table, and it was piled high with stuff. Absolutely piled high, huge. Whereas I had been painting these little still lives at home that my father had set up. Then this which is absolutely amazing. So, um, time passed and uh, I was going every so often my father would take me to see this painter. His name was Harold Copping and he was, he was, he was heavy on drink and he, sometimes in the afternoon he'd be quite drunk but he didn't show in his work. And the things he was doing for my father <coughs> were th scenes from the Bible, scenes from the Holy Land. He'd come into my father's office in the 20s with a portfolio, aged about 22, and he'd shown him these drawings which were incredible. So they decided, they said to him, look, <coughs> we like these drawings, they're tremendous, we want to, we want to send you to the Holy Land two to three years. We want you to study the characters there. We want you to study the geology. We want you to walk in the very footsteps that Jesus walked while on earth and absorb it all. So that when you come back, we can commission you. We can commission you four paintings a year for the Bible. You can illustrate the whole Bible. That's our aim. So that's what part, that's what happened. He came back and he started on these things. But by this time that I'm telling you about now, they wanted to produce a New Testament. And the picture they wanted most, which was going to be the most important, was going to be the Last Supper. So they said to Herod Copping, would you paint us a picture of the Last Supper now? He said, no. <laughs> I'm not ready. I've got to be ready for it. So time passed and... He painted more pictures. Have you started the Last Supper? No, I haven't. I'm not, still not ready. And then the time came when my father came back and he said, he started the Last Supper. It's <laughs> on his easel. So, this was terrific. Now, time has now, um, I, let me see now, 47, 45. 46 I think it was and the firm began to publish other books they wanted to expand from the Bible <clears throat> they wanted to publish other books but they didn't want to publish books which were sort of in any way controversial because they were a religious firm so at that time Richard Jeffries the great na nature writer of the Victorian times, um, his books 
had all come out of copyright. So they decided to reprint Richard Jeffrey's books. And my father would bring me, as he published, he'd bring me this book home. Now, anything that my father did for me, I felt was for a purpose. He, I was very, very close to him, indeed. I loved him dearly. And so when he gave me this book, I felt that I've got to read it really well and thoroughly. But as it turned out, it was a book, a beautiful book for me, because he was writing about the countryside as I remembered it in Hay, but hadn't been able to get to it now. And um, I'll tell you, I'll show you just a little passage to give you the kind of thing. This is, this is the original book that he gave me, believe it or not, and it's illustrated by Agnes Parker. And the illustrations in it were as important as the actual writing to me, because they had some sort of mystical quality, um, which I can't quite explain, which I loved. And uh, this is the kind of writing, you might find it very rich, but at that time it was just perfect for me. Um, he's, he's, he's just going out in the, into the summer, in the sound of summer, and going over the uh, grass. And he says this, and this is just taken at random, all things that are beautiful are found by chance, like everything that is good. Here by me is a praying rug, just wide enough to kneel on. This is a bit of grass. The richest gold inwoven with crimson. All the sultans of the east never had such beauty as that to kneel on. It is indeed too beautiful to kneel on. For the life in those golden flowers must not be broken down even for that purpose. They must not be defaced, not a stem bent. It is more reverent not to kneel on them, for this carpet prays itself. I will sit by it and let it pray for me. It is so common, bird's foot, lotus, it grows everywhere. Yet if I purposely search for days, I should not have found a plot like this, so rich, so golden, so glowing with sunshine. You might pass by it in one stride, yet it is worthy to be thought of for a week and remembered for a year. And um, that is that kind of writing which is so, so powerful and directed and straight, went straight to my, my heart. Well, um, this, this longing for the countryside um, started at that point, I think, and I wanted desperately to get back to it. But first of all, I had to go to the art school, so I went for my interview at the art school, and they were asking me lots of questions and things, and I didn't think I was doing very well. <clears throat> and then one of them said to me, Who painted the Last Supper? <laughs> <laughs> I thought, ah. Now, oh yes, yes, I know who painted the Last Supper. I, I, I know him. I saw him last week. <laughs> and uh, I said, he's Harold Coppy. <laughs> and they all looked very, very mystified. At this. So I told them the story. You see, I told them the story of Harold Coppy. He said, have you ever never heard of Leonardo da Vinci? I said, no. <laughs> because although my father was interested in art, he was very sort of hit and miss. He was interested in certain artists, but not others, and he didn't know anything about them. So I'd taken all my paintings, a great mass of paintings, which I'd been painting at home, to them. And they were very, very amused by these paintings. They said, why do you, how do you paint like, like this? Because how I was painting was how my father had taught me, which he'd obviously got from books, and it was a kind of a renaissance technique. Very, very slow and laborious, and sort of drawing it all out very carefully, and then painting it all with a local colour. 
or rather painting it tonally first and then using local colour on those bits of uh, thing in, in order to get it really bright like the Renaissance wanted to, they wanted it to sing. So these paintings that I took weren't anything like the paintings that were being painted by most people which looked very grubby by the side of them. And um, so they completely changed the way of painting and it was quite ingrained my father's technique. And so <clears throat> I had a bit of a struggle um, at art school during the during the breaks during the holidays I used to cycle out first of all I cycled to um, Romney Marsh and then <coughs> I love Romney Marsh I, and I drew the churches and, I, and then I had a little tent and I camped out and I was away for two or three days and I used to take my own water with me. I have got my bike and I've got two gallons of water on the front. And also I used to take a damn cheese, a big red cheese like that. And that was what I used to live on. And that's probably why I've been so ill all my life. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this lasted me about two or three days. I had it for breakfast, I had it for lunch and dinner and everything. With tea. So... Um, Gradually I became more ambitious. I went up to the Breckland in Norfolk, 400 square miles of sandy soil filled with um, desolate churches. All the villages had disappeared, all the medieval villages, most of them had disappeared, but they'd left the churches and the churches were all in ruins. This is what I loved. And I again made lots of drawings. And still more and more ambitious, I decided I'd go down to Maiden Castle. Because by this time, my father had brought me home more books that they were publishing. One of them was in Thomas Hardy. And I was obsessed with Thomas Hardy and where he came from <coughs> and the landscape he described. So down I went with my bike and a telescope because I was very interested in astronomy. I used to go down there because of the dark skies. And um, I went to I went to Maiden Castle one one weekend, and then I one longer time a week. I went down as far as Dart Dartmoor, and actually on to Dartmoor, and and slept by the one of these you know great tours and things. And that was superb. It was absolutely deserted, and it was just the kind of landscape that I thought was terrific and um, strangely enough I didn't paint any of these at the art school and I just just went there and enjoyed them and drew sketches and things like that but I didn't actually do any paintings of them which was curious well not really because the power of the teaching was very strong at the art school there were only eight people in this group in this art group we were taking the National Diploma and painting is special and um, so there was just these eight students and the tutor and it was quite powerful stuff in the way that they taught. They didn't want you to paint other than the way they explained it to you which was very tonal and um, it was a two year course and towards the end of the two years, I'd been deferred because I should have gone into the army to do national service when I was 18. But because I was doing the national diploma, they deferred me for two years until I'd finished the diploma. And I finished the diploma in July. And in fact, I was in the army by the beginning of August. But in the April of that year, um, I became friendly with a girl who had been in the painting group all the time that I had been there. But I'd never actually um, sort of knew her at all well. I loved her painting and I was a bit in awe of her painting, I think. It was very, very different from 
anybody else's. And she was very, very tall and intense. But how I got to know her, I can't remember, but it was in the April of that year. And our friendship was not at all physical. <clears throat> I mean, it was physical. We used to hold hands and things. But I don't think I ever kissed her. And she sort of transformed me, really, with her... This is the first time I'd come up against um, such feminine qualities. And they were so different from anything that I'd experienced. But she opened up in a, a complete world. She lived it down, which was right out in the countryside, very remote. And her mother and father were terribly religious. Her mother used to carry the Bible around wherever she went, even when she went to feed the pig. <laughs> and it didn't, it didn't go over to Rosemary. Rosemary didn't seem, she didn't seem to be religious in that way intensely, but she was very intense about poetry, for instance. She introduced me to poetry. She could, she could speak. She, she, she read um, John, John Milton's uh, Paradise Lost. Um, she, was, she loved all the metaphysical poets. She loved all the Victorian poets. And she could quote from them all. And another strange thing she, she did, she loved, she loved quietness. And she introduced me to Quietness. We'd go out in the evening. I had to walk to down, which was seven miles from my house. And I wouldn't get there until about half past eight. And we, because of her mother and father, it wouldn't allow her any boyfriends. We had to arrange a rendezvous at the gate of a certain field and so on. And as I got nearer and nearer, I became more and more excited and so on by this prospect of meeting her because she had this p tremendous power and um, she'd take me by the hand and we'd go into this field of long grass at about nine o'clock on a summer's night and she would just simply say listen and lay back and listen and we lay back in the grass holding hands for about an hour as the darkness gradually fell and that experience was absolutely unbelievable because I would never have thought of that, never have done that before. But it, the power of nature and the mystical qualities of the light and everything all added up and her kind of throbbing intensity all added up to something really amazing. But by the beginning of July she became ill. I think while well, I'm still doing our painting exam. And um, cut a long story short, she got consumption. She got galloping consumption. So she changed from what she was. She got thinner and thinner. She went into hospital. Her voice was all husky, you could hardly hear it. When she lifted her arm up, it was all bone. It was quite horrifying. And then I had to go into the army. So I left her. Went into the army. I never saw her again to this day. And I never wrote to her. And she never wrote to me. I don't know why, but that's, that's what happened. Yeah. Absolutely clean break like that. I went into the army for two years, sent to Malaya in the jungle. Didn't like it. <laughs> Came home again. Came home again two years later to take the entrance to the Royal College. My father's aim was to get me to the Royal College of Art. And um, so I had to go back to the art school in Beckenham because they, you had to put your pictures for the examination to, to go to the Royal College in, in Christmas. So I got those three months in order to paint pictures to take, which I did. <coughs> and I, went to the Royal College of Art and found that uh, by this time I was painting um, churches and scenes and 
things like that, and which they didn't like at all, especially Ruskin Spear. Ruskin Spear happened to be my tutor, which was unfortunate. <laughs> and he used to come and shout at me and say, what the bloody hell do you think you're painting those for? Pick picturesque pictures for calendars, he said. <laughs> That's what they're good for. You want to paint real life? Anyway, he said, you want to paint something else than all these ruins and castles? So I went home and I put a map up of Britain and I threw a dart at it. <laughs> and I, I said to myself, wherever that dart falls, I shall go and I shall walk for 20 minutes from the station in a northerly direction and then I shall stop and whatever I see, I shall draw and paint and see what happens. Well, the first dart fell in Barnley and I got there early in the morning and it was raining and I walked my... 20 minutes and stopped and in front of me was a lot of factories and things black sky anyway I painted it and uh, then another time and a second time I threw the dart and it landed in Morley which is near Leeds so I got the train to Leeds then I got a bus to Morley and I got out of the bus and I was in a strange landscape this time, with big sheds and things. And these were the rhubarb raising sheds, you know. Uh, so I thought, well, this time I'll do a painting eight foot by four foot, huge thing, of these marvellous sheds. Great brown painting it was. <laughs> and um, it, got the, it got the prize at college for the best painting of the year <laughs> and um, towards the end of that um, college business, three years, uh, just out of the blue came a letter to say that being awarded the scholarship to Italy for two years, £2,000 and uh, I was getting ready to go to Italy I'd gone out and bought a Lambretta for £164, brand new, in South Kensington. And this was what I was going to Italy on. And it would take me all over Italy. And at the end, just towards the end of the last week almost, the registrar came running down the corridor calling my name. And he said, oh, you're wanted on the phone. I said, well, who's, who's that? No, he's a very important man. He, he wants to speak to you urgently. So anyway, I went and listened to this chap. He said, I'm, I'm Henry Morris. and I'm building up a collection of artists and craftsmen who are going to work on stuff for the new towns and Coventry Cathedral. And uh, we very, very much like your work. We've seen it at the... College, and we'd very much like you to be one of our painters, three, one of three. There'll only be 16 altogether, and we're, we're converting this um, stately home, country home, in its own park, and we're building your studios to fit what you want. You tell us what you want, and we'll build it. When you come back from Italy, It'll all be ready. You'll be able to come and live here. Well, um, uh, me just going off to Italy and me being a very horrible, arrogant man. <laughs> I said, yeah, I know that. I don't like this idea much. So I was a bit cool. And he said, no, no, it's, it's, please come out and see it. At least come out and see it. I said, well, I'm off to Italy in about three days. He said, well, come tomorrow. <clears throat> He's very insistent. So I went. And he showed me over in his wonderful house. He'd already built a studio for the stained glass artists who were building the windows for Coventry. Uh, they were huge, great, 30-foot tall buildings. 
So they get these windows in, and um, he said, this should be yours, this is going to be your studio, this is next to theirs. And it, was, it was about as big as this gallery. That's how big it was. It's huge, only much higher. And the flat that I was going to inhabit was above <coughs> three rooms. Lovely. Overlooked the lawn and cedar trees. So, I went to Italy and I ended up in a, after three months, I ended up in, the mount, in a mountain town, mountain village, 3,000 feet high, at 100 miles east of Rome. And I used to paint all day. I used to start early in the morning and go on until nightfall. I'd taken out all my own canvases, taken out two different sized stretchers. So either my paintings was that size or it was that size. It couldn't, there was nothing in between. And I painted, sometimes I went down to the Carl, uh, Hadrian's villa with my easel and painted all day. There was nobody about in those days. No, no, hardly any visitors. So you had it to yourselves and it was absolutely gorgeous. And then there was um, Tivoli with it, all its wonderful wines and things which I used to take with me and a little picnic and everything. And I was in heaven. Absolute heaven. I painted all these <coughs> pictures until um, about halfway through, I think it was. About a, I'd been there about a year painting these. My mother used to write to me every fortnight. And I got this letter from my mother, as usual, and opened it. And it said, something terrible has happened. Your sister, Peggy. Peggy was her name. Your sister Peggy is dead. She's committed suicide. While I was with Pammy. That's my other sister. Elder sister. And then she said in great big letters, You are not to come home. There's nothing that you can do. You have to stay there and finish to the time. So, it was a terrible, terrible blow. I was very close to Peggy, she was the nearest sister. And um, I, I sat down and I cried, I think, for a day and a night almost. And all these pictures, all around the wall, like that. And I, looked at these pictures and I thought this paint, all these paintings are the accumulation of all the teaching that I've had. There are other people's ideas about painting and nothing really to do with me. All the things, the passions and the pains and things are not in these pictures. They are not part of my life. All my interests are not there, and they should be. I've got to make them more personal. They're totally impersonal at the moment. And uh, I didn't know how I was going to do this. But when I came back, I used to have a piano. I was very, very fond. I, I was torn between music and art really and I used to practice two or three hours a day on this piano for years and uh, I said to my mother where is the piano and she said I've broken it all up we didn't want it nobody played it took up a lot of room and I said well what's happened to it she said, well, most of it's gone, but there's some of it down at the bottom of their garden, in the hedge. So I went down there and there were a lot of keys and bits and pieces of hammer. and I put them all in a bag. And by this time, I was at Digswell House. This is where, where I came back to, you remember. And they had arranged 
as they said they would, they said they would arrange an exhibition of all my Italian work and all these people would come, headmasters and councillors and people with, who were in charge of money and to decorate these new places. And to cut a long story short, they bought everyone except two, which I kept. And they were £400 each. And there were 38 of them. So I suddenly became a very rich man. <laughs> you know, from being absolutely poverty stricken. I came back from Italy on my Lambretto. I had no money except for the petrol. I was absolutely poor. I lived off, well, lettuces. Uh, three or four lettuces I'd eat from a, from a field. Uh, anything like that, Brussels sprouts or whatever. I didn't shave, I didn't wash. I was an absolute tramp. But I got back to the coast and there was an AA man stall by the ferry because I didn't have any money to get on the ferry. And I said, told him my story. I said I'd come all this way from Rome without any money, and how was I going to get onto the ferry? And he took his wallet out and gave me 20 quid. He said, here you are, it's 20 pounds, that'll be enough. He said, I trust you, here's my address, you send it back when you're ready. So I bought the ticket, I went on board, went straight down to the canteen, had an enormous breakfast, <laughs> coffee, toast, marmalade, marvellous, absolutely wonderful. And um, eventually ended up at Digswell. Well, everything was, as it said, beautiful room, beautiful studio, virtually no money, I think it was a pound a week, rent, and I just sold 38 paintings at £400 <laughs> each. <laughs> And I lived like a king, I had steak, I had this, I had that. <laughs> it didn't matter. It was a wonderful feeling. And every time I went to the bank, there was more money in it. Because <laughs> I was still selling the old painting from all these people that were coming, that had been organised. And, um, uh, where, where, what did we happen after that? Um, Digswell. Oh yes, I started to, I started to, um, well no, no, let me go back to the time when I was in Italy, because this is again important. I began to think not only of the teaching that had affected all my painting, but also of the history of art that I'd been taught. Now the history of art as they were taught was a kind of logical thing, which sort of development going right the way back. But all the artists that I liked weren't on there. <laughs> they weren't mentioned. So I decided to work out my own history of art, alternative version. And um, I thought that this the history of art as taught was done by art historians and they, they made a kind of a pattern that they, th they thought this man influenced that man and that man was influenced by that man, so on. And anybody that didn't fit into that, they left out, so you didn't know about them. Uh, and, and all these people they left out were the people that I liked, on the whole. So when I, when I got back um, after Digswell, I was still at Digswell, and um, I put in some paintings to what was known as a Young Contemporaries exhibition, where you could put six paintings in and they'd be chosen, they might chose one or two. But on this occasion I put six paintings in and they chose all six paintings. And a little while after I got a phone call and it said, I'm a, I'm a London um, gallery, Gimpelfels, and uh, I've seen your six paintings in the young contemporaries, and we'd be very happy if you would let us have 12 paintings and we'll put on an exhibition. So 
they put on this exhibition in London, which is my first exhibition, and they sold all these paintings, which is very good, and they said to me, could you just let us have 12 more? We don't want anything other than these, these particular paintings. These are paintings of landscape and still life. And I, as I say, being an arrogant, horrible man, <laughs> said to them, no, I'm not going to paint these paintings again. I'm going to paint what I want to paint. And our little friendship ended <laughs> at that point. And my hatred of the galleries ended at that point. And I was dead against them. And that's why I um, sort of Well, I don't know, I think I took a long time to come round to them again. But that was one important thing about the, the Ruris moving out of London. So, I began to teach at Beckenham Art School. And uh, just for one day, I used to teach painting. And I gradually got more work. I got um, another day at another art school and another day at another art school and so on. And um, began to teach there and find students who were sympathetic. Then they asked me to do some history of art lectures. Uh, first of all at Epsom, then at Kingston Polytechnic and then in the Royal Academy School used to go to the Royal Academy Schools. And of course, now I'm a senior lecturer in the history of art. And I didn't teach the history of art as usual. I taught my history of art. <laughs> and I told them about all these artists. Uh, uh, artists that... Um, I'll just read you a quick list of the artists that I used to show them, teach them. Here's a list of artists between the 20s, 30s and 40s. Lamorna Birch, Frank Cowper, Ethel Walker, Stanhope Forbes, Charles March Geary, John Nash, Paul Nash, Stanley Spencer, Meredith Frampton, Laura Knight, F.L. Griggs, Dodd Proctor, Early Sutherlands, Paul Drury, William Hyde, Agnes Parker, Robin Tanner, Cyril Collins, David Jones, John Craxton, Edgar Holloway, Mark Gertler, Dora Carrington. Those are the kind of people. And before the First World War, still going back, Walter Crane, Edward Hughes, Maxwell Armfield, Charles Shannon, John Duncan, Mary Florence, Thomas Gott, Eleanor Fortescue, Brickdale. Now, most people wouldn't have heard of those, one of those. But those are the ones that I like so much. And as I went on through the years, there were certain students that took to this, very much so. And one of them was David Inshaw. He started, I, I taught him from the moment he got to the art school to the moment he left, which was three or four years. And then he got into the academy schools, and of course I was teaching at the academy schools as well, so I carried on. And there were others, there was a chap called John Morley and Diana Howard, and these, these students who were very much on my kind of wavelength. And I used to see students, brilliant students, painting students, and they would leave and they couldn't get a job. They couldn't get a job. They couldn't sell their work and they couldn't find work anywhere else. And it was a really horrible thing to witness because it was huge talent. And I, I myself didn't want to teach for long. I wanted to paint all full time. And by this time I'd met Anne, who um, nearly half past nine, nearly half past eleven, um, had gone to Epsom Art School 
and uh, she, I went to Epsom Art School by her from another girlfriend I had when I was at the college who had come from Epsom Art School called Moya. She took me back to Epsom because of the teacher. She said, the teacher, you're liking me, he, he loves all the things that you like. So I, she took me back and met this Ron Benham, who indeed he, he did, he loved all these things, he was a man of the countryside. And had a, he was in the war and he had a very, very bad stutter, so you had to listen very long. And this, this kind of gave it a certain sort of importance. Even if he said, he, would I like a cup of tea, you know, it sounded... Because <laughs> it took so long to come out. And um, hanging on his walls of his little studio, little shack studio, were paintings by these students that liked, liked Ron and used to gather around him like a little gang, drink tea and talk. And I looked at these paintings and they were just ordinary paintings, and uh, as you see in our, most art schools. But I saw one little one, which I loved. I went over to it and looked at it. There was a red wall, had a green door in the middle of it, which was half open, a shadow across it, and there were plant, little plants and weeds along there. If you look very closely, you can see moss between the bricks. And the way the moss had been painted, where it went into the shadow and where it came out into the light, was absolutely amazing. And so I said, this is, this is a beautiful picture. Who painted this picture? And a little shy girl put her hand up. She said, me. Um, and, and. So I said, well, it is, this is something special. You've been painting a long time. She said, no, this is my first painting. I've been ill with... I've been in hospital for three years with TB and I've always loved painting and when I was, got better I came down to the art school and said could I join the art school and I showed them little drawings and things I've done in hospital and they said yes come straight in and she walked straight into the painting room and did this painting and this was a turning, another turning point for me because I thought there was some quality about this painting which linked the quality of rosemary, the, the kind of intensity of rosemary was somehow portrayed by the intensity of this painting. I can't explain it, but there, there was an innocence about rosemary and there was an innocence about this painting and about Anne. And I, I then, I married her, not for until I came back from Italy, I didn't see her again. But uh, I went back to, to, to Epsom after I came back from Italy and I met her and um, fell in love with her more or less immediately. And we were married three weeks later. And we went to Cornwall and I took all my books. And an idea was beginning to form in my head that I could form um, a group of all these people, like John Morley and, De and David, and my friend uh, Peter Knott, who was a painter and had gone to Epsom Art School, and his wife, and we could all pool our resources and go to Cornwall and build a, a, a and buy a house together, and we could share things. We could share. We didn't have to have a lot of cars, we could only have one. And we could have one washing machine, and so on and so forth. This plan was about 68. And it gradually, 1968, it gradually grew. And we got nearer and nearer. And when we thought we were just about to do it, it all fell apart because Peter Knott didn't want to go with John Morley. He said, I can't go. I don't, I can't get on with him. And in any case, John Morley and um, Diana Howard wanted to go to Suffolk. They didn't want to go to Cornwall. <laughs> so it's all these little petty things <laughs> fell away. So there was just left a nucleus of myself, Anne, and David Inshaw. David Inshaw 
would come and see us frequently at the weekend and we'd go out in the country drawing and painting and talking about how we were going to get out of this rat race and concentrate on what we wanted to do which was painting all the time painting all the time and we decided that we'd form a little group called the Broadheath Brotherhood after Broadheath because Elgar had been a provincial artist and, and had shunned London and so on and that's just what we wanted to do and so it did gradually transpire and we exhibited together as the Broadheath Brotherhood there's only three of us and it wasn't enough we needed more in order to produce enough paintings so that you could have two or three exhibitions a year whereas if you're on your own you can't produce enough paintings even if you sell out you've got, you've got to build up again it takes time and you've got to live and it's difficult impossible so what happened was we decided to move from Sussex to sell our house in Sussex and move to Devizes where David had already bought a sort of four-story Georgian house because he was teaching at Bristol at the time and um, he's teaching silk screen, he's marvellous silk screen, marvellous printmaker David and a wonderful painter and um, great inspiration so we three of us lived together in this house for a bit until the house next door came up for sale which we then bought very cheap because we sold our, our, our house in Sussex for I think £25,000 and this Georgian house in Devizes four storeys high was 6000 <laughs> so we were, we were okay we moved in and we started to paint David's very gregarious, he goes out, he meets people. We're rather reserved, we don't like doing that. David went out and he met people. One of the people he met was uh, Val um, Wilson. And she said uh, that she was the owner of the festival gallery in Bath, which was quite big then, the festival of Bath was quite big and very very successful and they had this gallery she said I'll give you an, three of you, I'll give you an exhibition she'd seen how, she'd come up and she'd seen how <coughs> and uh, so she gave us this exhibition in Bath and her husband was the curator of all the museums in Bristol and he came along and he said to us you must have an exhibition in the City Art Gallery so we had an exhibition in the City Art Gallery and people came and went and one of them was Peter Blake. Peter Blake came to the exhibition and he saw this BHB which he was very intrigued by. He found out who we were and phoned us up he said I've seen these things. What is the BHB? We told him. We were a little group. He said well we've just come down from the West Country. Could you come over? So we all went over to his house, which was a deserted station where they pulled up the rails and there was still the platform there and there's a platform there and there's still the seats on the platform and there was the signal box and it was very good, very good. I think they lived in the ticket office, didn't they? <laughs> but anyway, um, he said, we've got, uh, we love this idea of exhibiting yeah. as a group and uh, my wife Jan, American uh, painter, <coughs> art and sculptor, she's very, very keen. And uh, we've got two dear friends down in Cornwall who uh, just a couple of years ago moved down there in this, this valley, this quiet little valley. And uh, they're building their own house. They go out into the fields and they bring in the granite and it's all cut up. And they're building this marvellous house. They're absolutely, you know, they love to join. So we decided on a meeting on the 21st of March, 1975, and we all met for the first time. 
uh, as we as we got into the house, we noticed that there was a strange man sitting on a seat on the platform. Tall, thin man, smoking. We didn't take him there, so. And we went into the house and started our, just about to start our meal that they'd got, when this chap came in. He said, do you mind if I join you? Peter said, no, no, come in, come in. So he came in, sat there, very, very quiet, and then we were all excited, we were all talking about what we are going to call ourselves, and uh, various names were suggested, and what, we, what our aims were, and why we were doing it, and all this. <clears throat> and it rumbled on for some time, and then this stranger got up and he said, excuse me, I think this is what you want. I think this is what you're trying to say. And he gave us this marvellous spiel. And we said, yes, yes, that is exactly what we want. It's exactly. So he, he wrote it all down. And then Peter said, now, next year, 1976, I've been given a job, I've been given a room, because I'm trying to liven up the Royal Academy, to bring in things, you know, that <coughs> weren't normally there. And they hit upon the idea of giving it to one artist, and he could have his own choice in one room. So he said, oh, my choice is going to be a painting from each of us. We're all going away, and we're all going to do a painting. And then <coughs> I'll put it up in the 1976 exhibition. And um, we put them all up with our little label. I can't remember a word of it. So I can't tell you what it said, <laughs> and it's never been found again, it disappeared. Uh, but anyway, it was very good. <laughs> and the thing caused a sensation, because I think because of the writing that we didn't like what was going on and everything, and we wanted to, to be inspired by the countryside and the craftsmanship. Of, of, of many British artists in the past. We wanted that, we were interested in that, and we wanted it to flower again. So I think that was the thing that really rubbed up against people. Now our paintings were all different. We painted in different styles. We were all individuals, totally different. We had similar interests, which overlapped in some cases, but in other cases didn't. So it wasn't as if we were all the same. How we got on, it's difficult to say, but what happened was that certain people could do certain things, like I love driving a lorry with all the paintings. So I'd take all the paintings up to whichever gallery it would be. And somebody else would love to go to private views in other galleries and meet people and introduce them to us. And we were prepared to exhibit anywhere and at any time because seven people always had a quantity of work. So we put on an exhibition. Somebody phoned us up and said, could you put an exhibition on tomorrow? We say yes, because we could. And this is what happened at McCuntleth. They phoned up and they said, could you put an exhibition on for us? Yes, we'll come, we'll hang it, do everything, which we did. And then BBC were making art films and they, they saw it at the, at the Academy and they sent along one of their art directors to see if it was worth making a film, which ended up by him making a film about the ruralists. He'd come down to where we were working and in the countryside and all that. And he made this this hour-long film, which was shown in 1978, I think. And it was shown at a fairly late time, and it had five million viewers. But a year later, they re-showed the film. This time they showed it at eight o'clock, I think. And they had something like 12 million viewers. So you'd go out into the street, and people would recognize you. It's a f funny sensation. 
You might be anywhere in some remote place. <laughs> Somebody come up and say, you're a ruralist. <laughs> you know, it was funny. And um, the worst thing, though, that happened was that the Sunday Times, at the time of this exhibition, they got in contact with us and they said, we would like to do an article on you, on the ruralists. So they sent down a bloke who had just come back from Vietnam and he was sort of shell-shocked. And he got the idea, he knew nothing about art, nothing about painting, and he got the idea that we were kind of mamby-pambies in the countryside, you know. <laughs> and he put over this picture, which was completely distorted, nothing about painting at all, hardly. And it was all about the, the women were in Laura Ashley dresses <laughs> with, um, with flour, flour on their hands, making, making lardy cakes. <laughs> and that gave a very bad impression and we met a lot of uh, resistance to it. But that was my own particular thread to the ruralists. And it started in 1976 and it would have gone on had it not been for a terrible calamity. That was about 1980 or so. Jan, his, uh, Peter's wife, suddenly said at breakfast, the marriage is over, I'm leaving. And she went. And then Peter had to sell up Willow, had to sell up a lot of his art to pay his terrible business. And he had to go back to London. He said, well, I, how can I be a ruralist? I'm living in London, so I'm going to leave the ruralists. And also, um, we've been approached by various galleries. They wanted to show our work. Well, Anne and I were very resistant to that, because that's one of the reasons why we'd left. And, um, uh, who was it? What? What's the name of the gallery that David went to? In London. Famous gallery. Waddington. Waddington. Yeah, Waddington. Waddington didn't. He, he liked David's work, and he wanted to show David's work, <coughs> but he didn't want to show David's work. He wanted to make him an individual. And the trouble with the group is that you get lumped with all the others. That's one of the risks you've got to take. So, David, we received bad criticism from a lot of critics, which David didn't like, and so he left. So that just left the four of us. And then we continued on, exhibiting uh, here and there. We'd already had a, um, before, before we broke up, uh, the Arts Council decided to arrange a travelling exhibition. They put Nicholas Usherwood, who was coming, who was the secretary at the academy, to organise it. And it's a huge exhibition because all all our paintings were uh, seven people, huge paintings, some of them, took up enormous rooms. The Arnold Feeney had started. And the Arnolfini had more people come to it than they had ever had before to any exhibition. And from the Arnolfini it went to the Birmingham City Art Gallery. From the Birmingham City Art Gallery it went to Glasgow Third Eye. And then from Glasgow Third Eye it went down to London. And um, we were seven ruralists were invited to dinner at the Chelsea Arts Club, I think. And I had the great pleasure of kissing Marianne Faithful. This <laughs> 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 is an unexpected pleasure. <laughs> anyway, that was um, that was raw, that was the sort of a heyday of it, I think. And when these other artists left, um, it was more 
are ruralist because the other um, artists, Peter and David, sort of there was a resistance from David to us, I think, and Peter Blake never fitted in anyway. It was Jan, his wife, who was the persuasive member, and he was pleased enough to go along. But there are very few paintings by Peter that you could call ruralist paintings. The, 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 um, the heart of it was Annie Ovenden and myself and Anne and, um, and his husband. And we carried on like that for many, many, many years, exhibiting as usual and not. And so here we are, we arrive 40 years later. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So that's my personal story. <laughs> You should ruffle yourself. <laughs> An evening with Graham. <laughs> this is for you. Yes. Thank you very much, Graham. That was fascinating, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Um, and uh, we're well over the hour. It doesn't matter. I think we could have gone on even longer. But I want to thank Annie as well, who's sitting here um, quietly. <laughs> um, you mean I didn't? I